It's a pleasure to host uh, Professor Benjamin Van Boy uh, from the Amsterdam, Amsterdam University of Amsterdam and the uh, 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 and the good uh, friend and colleague, uh, co-editor of uh, Regulation and Governance, uh, on a topic that I don't know anything about, uh, <laughs> but it's really, really important, uh, compliance and toxic corporate uh, culture. Uh, Benjamin also will uh, say a few words about himself, and about his research and background, um, and then go on uh, directly to the, to the lecture. Thank you very much for being with us, Benjamin. Well, well thank you so much, David, for hosting, and it's been a pleasure to finally come here and see you in your own university setting. Um, so my name is Benjamin van Roy, um, in Dutch, I think the pronunciation of my first name is similar to the Hebrew, Benjamin. Um, and my work is on uh, law and behavior. So I, I study why do people obey rules, why do they break rules. And uh, I very much focus on what I call the ex ante function of law. So if we make laws, how is it going to change behavior in the future? Whereas a lot of what we do in law school is ex post. Something bad has happened and we look at how do we assign liability afterwards. Um, and often lawyers assume that by assigning the liability, they're also doing something for the future. Those assumptions are not really made explicit. Um, the research today is one of the larger projects I'm doing. The other large project, and I just got an ERC consolidator grant for that, uh, is on the behavioral assumptions of lawyers. And it's about how lawyers who are coding our behavior, um, how do they assume they can actually do so? Because lawyers do not receive much training in behavior. So it's looking generally, um, both at lawyers but also at humans more generally, at what are the behavioral intuitions that we have? So similar to behavioral economics, which questions the intuitions about statistics, my research tries to understand the intuitions people have about behavior. So it, it, it's developing a line of research where I've seen that all the science that, that, that people have developed over the years about behavior, it very seldomly really goes into practice. And I see that uh, if I teach people, for instance, about the criminology of the turns, they see the science, but it doesn't really arrive. And that's the interesting thing. How do we get all this knowledge that we are, we're developing? How does that actually go into our own intuitions? And how does it go against it? Um, so that's my other research, uh, which seeks to start or stimulate a behavioral revolution in law, like behavioral economics has done for economics. Uh, it's not the same as behavioral law in economics, which I think is much more correction on rational choice thinking. My idea is much more to make broader behavioral knowledge, which I think is much broader than the field of law of behavioral economics, make that much more available in the field of law. Anyway, I won't talk too much about that. This project talks about what we should do when we see uh, massive misconduct existing on a larger scale for a larger period of time in large organizations. I focus today on corporations, but a lot of what I say you can also apply to public organizations. So after I finish this paper, I watch a documentary on Netflix about the Oakland, Oakland, Oakland Police Department. Very, very close. Everything I've been reading about the Catholic Church very, very close. Things I've been reading about the Dutch, the Dutch Prosecutorial Office, very, very close. Uh, a case in my own university of the 20 years of sexual harassment, where one person was, um, through his career, uh, uh, actually harassing students, very, very close. The basic idea is that if we have misconduct in organizations, and its worst forms, and these are some of the forms we can talk about are, are the cases here. At some point, it's not just about the individual. It's not just about what social psychologists, organizational psychologists call the bad apple. At some point, it's about the barrel. It may even be about the orchid. Um, it, it's larger than the individual. At some point, we're talking about culture. I hate, talk, I hate using the word culture normally. I think culture is often a term that uh, can be so broad that you can put any variable in it and it kind of, it kind of, stress, it kind of, it kind of um, uh, pushes out any other analysis. Here, 
I am more comfortable using it because we ha we're not using it at a national cultural level, we're using it at an organizational cultural level. What I mean by that is, if it's in a culture, it is not in the individual human, it is, so to speak, in the walls of the organization. And if you're trying to address organizations who have um, persistent violating or uh, rule breaking or other forms of misconduct, I'm not, in the, in the paper, I'm not only talking about law breaking behavior, I've not acted as a lawyer in the paper, you cannot address it without addressing the culture. And we seem to have a cultural moment on Wall Street, even. There's many, there's several CEOs who've said after some of these scandals, it's culture. Um, when I was at NYU last year at a conference, I ended up being at a table uh, with several uh, general counsels from large banks, including Bank Suisse and several of these others, as well as the general counsel of the New York Stock Exchange. And they asked me, what do you do? I said, because I was writing this paper, I said, I do culture. They all started to laugh. They said, we all do culture. And they asked, what do you do then? I said, well, I am trying to use my knowledge as an anthropologist and somebody who also studies, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a formal anthropologist, but it's, it's more of the, the methods I've used in my field work in China. Um, as a qualitative scholar, as well as knowledge about criminology, psychology, and organizational science, to actually pinpoint where are the toxic elements in organizations that sustain these these forms of wrongdoing. And suddenly they were all silent and listening. So I saw with different interactions I've had with lawyers that also normal lawyers, when I left Irvine and moved back to Holland, I had like a goodbye with some of the practitioners I've been working with. Very different practitioners, not just regulators or, or top level uh, people in banks. And when I told them about this project, they said, oh yeah, we, we get these questions. Well, we don't know what to do. So we've moved from, let's say, compliance 1.0, where you're developing a compliance management system, to maybe compliance 2.0, where sort of you want the compliance management system to do something on behavior, to compliance as culture. And there's different ways of looking at this. One way is to say, okay, we have to instill a compliance culture. Okay, so that's on the positive side. How do you get a culture that sustains good behavior, that makes people obedient? I'm not talking about that today. If you're interested in that, Susan Silby, and Ruth and, and Housing have a new, have a new paper, they've, they've written more about this. Several other scholars who write about this. There's also the worst case, which is a criminogenic organization, and, and criminologists have written about this, where a business at some point, its core objective, its core way to make money, its core business model is against the law. So think very made up. That's a criminogenic organization. I'm not talking about that. You also have businesses that have a disruptive culture, where the business model is, let's go into a market, let's not follow the rules, let's take the alternative, the, the advance you get from that. But the end game is that it would break open the regulation for the market, and, it, and the end game is to probably develop a legal business, but by disrupting the existing rules. I'm also not talking about that, even though Uber uh, is here, it's not here because of its disruptive, it's here because of some of the other elements that have been there, let's say the male chauvinist culture that has led to misconduct. Or Facebook, it's not because of the disruptive nature, even though I don't think Facebook has gone into markets the same way Uber has. What I'm talking about is a different thing, it's kind of in the middle of all of this. It is cultures that develop, and I'll talk about what culture is in a little bit, that develop in a way that in a business that has normal legitimate goals, that largely is making money through ways that are legal by people that consider themselves normal or good. I mean, I'm, I'm now referring to Yuval Feldman's new book, The Law of Good People. I was just discussing that yesterday at Paris Lam. Um, that yet have developed misconduct and rule breaking because there were elements in that culture of the organization that sustained it. That's what I'm talking about. Um, so I'm focusing, and this is, if you're a political scientist, you're going to find my methods weird, okay? So as soon as you say culture, you're less able to, to do it in a deep way with, with traditional quantitative methods. As soon as you operationalize it, you're already setting what the culture is. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So what I do here is very much an exploration. 
What I'm doing is, first of all, theoretically based on existing literatures that I know, is to talk about what, first of all, is elements in a corporate culture we should look at. So what is a corporate culture? What are, we, what are, what are the levels we're looking at? Second, within those levels, what are then the types of things that are toxic? And, and with toxic, I mean that sustain the kind of wrongdoing. And I use theoretical, or sorry, empirical literature to kind of find those things. Then I use three cases, Volkswagen, BP, and Wells Fargo, because there's so much information about them. Uh, one of my PhD students said to me, because I normally do my own field work, she said to me when she read the paper, she said, wow. And by the way, if you're interested, the paper has been published. It's uh, in Administrative Science. If you Google my name, Van Roy, with uh, Toxic Corporate Culture, you will find it. Um, and it's open access, so even if you don't have a subs subscription to it, you can, you can download it. And sorry, it's a very long paper, and it's poorly written because it was my first step into this. Um, and it's all my fault, not Adam, who's my co-author. He's a psychologist at, or at Arizona State. Um, so then we look into these cases to see, okay, do we actually see these elements? And I use it to explore what are the sorts of questions we could be asking when, when we are assessing. And now in the middle, actually this morning I was writing a kind of follow-up up paper that based on these cases says, okay, what is the kind of risk assessment we should be doing? So you have to see it as a paper that doesn't generalize to a population. It's not representative of anything, but it generalizes to ideas that we can then test in other populations. Okay? That's the best I can do with this at this moment. So, so it's based on case studies. And not perfect case studies. Perfect case studies would be me interviewing uh, uh, people in the companies, uh, former employees, it also would involve participant observation. So why does it involve that? Organizational culture, and I'm following uh, Shine's influential book, uh, Organizational Culture, which has 30,000 citations. I mean, if you ever want to plan a cool book, write something like that. It's a very clear book. Um, and his book is a bit different from what I'm looking at. He's looking in general at organizational culture, and he normally advises companies, how do you go from, uh, from culture A that's not so efficient to culture B that's more efficient? That's where most of the management science is. And his ideas are very helpful. He says that there is three levels, but he uses different levels than I do. His levels are just the first and the second. He says there's, there's structures, he calls them artifacts, these are the visible things of an organization. So you can see them in the rules, they've been written down, you can see them in the targets and incentives, you can see them in the kind of organizational charts, the hierarchy. Um, you, can, you can, of course, also talk about social hierarchy, which is not visible, but still structures. So for instance, if you have a department, you've all been in workplaces where maybe somebody has more influence than their position is. I've worked in a department with, with bullies. Some bullies have much more influence than a position. They're much tougher. So, so, so hierarchy may be more complex than just visible things. These are things that I think normally lawyers look at, especially the, the incentives. Uh, Shine also talks about architecture, for instance, which I think is an interesting element here. I mean, I've done studies in law firms in China and I've interviewed lawyers there about tax evasion, their own tax evasion. And I saw, for instance, the way they have doors, where they have glass doors and open, uh, the, kind of, the kind of spaces that did have an influence on the type of transparency there was in how they met with clients and how they could do things. So, so you can actually look deeper at, at the kind of visible things to, to get cues from this, which I haven't done in this project. Second level then is, is, is the, the values, which are both the explicit um, shared values. These are things people are saying to each other. Uh, they, they could also be written, you know, the, st the statements of leaders. Those are the things you can learn from interviews, surveys. Uh, injunctive social norms, this is, is a so social psychology term. It means what you think others think you should be doing. Again, you could interview people, you can do experiments with that. And then there's the hidden assumptions, and this term also comes from Shine. This is what, at some point when these things go deeper, at some point you're no longer thinking about it. It's what everybody in the organization knows, but doesn't, is, is not really conscious of anymore. This is much harder to get through through interviews. And if you go to this level through interviews, you're actually triggering a consciousness that may not be there. So Shine, even Shine says, you need anthropology for that. 
And I'm always happy when somebody says that because it, it means that I have something to do. Even though I'm not an anthropologist, it, it means that, okay, so it means also it's hard. It also means it's a basic limit and critique you can have of my whole paper. I never got to this level of this paper. So there's a whole level I'm not talking about today. Finally, as a third, and I added this to shine, is the practices. It's what people are doing. So first of all, if you have visible common behavior and unaware common behavior, so these are the descriptive social norms, as social psychologists call it. So uh, your colleague at ASU, Bob, Bob, Bob Cialdini, has shown the power of what others are doing. Even if you're not aware, you're more likely to do what others do. And this can, if you have negative social norms, I'll talk a little bit, a little bit about it, can actually be a very strong, powerful influence. And then the situational norms. This is when social norms attach themselves to situations. A good example is libraries. If you go into a library, you're automatically going to be silent, even if there's nobody there. Even more, you show, you show people a picture of a library, and experiments have shown they're going to be more silent. Even more, in Holland, we've applied that in our trains, we have these silent compartments, we've put, we've put pictures of books, and people have become, it's a nudge, I hate the word nudge, but, um, it's, and they become more silent. And people, when they smell cleaning the detergent, they're more careful when they eat a cookie. Anyway, this is cool psychology, maybe it's not replicable, we have all kinds of critiques, but there can also be, at a deeper level, these situational norms. So, as you can see with this, these are the levels we can study culture, there's only a few we can actually do as lawyers with texts. There's a few we can do with surveys and experiments, and there's a, uh, there's a few we can only do if we go deeply into organizations. So one of my PhD students, she spent three years working as a waitress in two restaurants in China. And she studied how the law comes in, into these two restaurants. So that's the kind of level I ideally want. But of course, if we're talking large corporations, you have all kinds of selection problems. Where are you going to be in these organizations? What are you going to do? Another method you could use is historical. If you look at Diane Vaughan's work on the space shuttle, a Challenger launch, so she has this book on, 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 on the space shuttle, uh, on how Challenger exploded, she kind of traced it back historically to a unit in NASA and to a kind of deviance that developed there at, a, at a quite a deep level. Not all of this, but, but, but quite. Anyway, this is the ideal. So what then is toxic at these different levels? And you can find these toxic norms at every level. First of all is what we would think most immediately about, is directly opposed norms. So these are norms that resist and compete with legal norms. So this, for instance, people are breaking the rules. Or people have thoughts that say, look, you don't need to, uh, to comply with these rules. We morally disagree. Like parking in the garage here, there's not enough space. <laughs> You, should, you can park even though there's a sign. I'm not many. You, you can park somewhere where, where even there's a sign because we don't think that's. It's also viewing behavior like that. So if you think back on this slide, visible behavior, you, you can see people doing that. You can even have incentives that are directly against that. Second, you can have it at some point. You can have norms that are not just competing with it, but also that's that normalize it. They don't say you're supposed to, uh, to, to go against rules, but they say, well, all right, maybe you shouldn't do it, but it's normal. Okay? It's not right, but it's normal. So that's, for instance, what happens if you don't have responses against rule breaking. If you have impunity, if, if there's a bystander effect, there's many other kinds of ways in which that can happen. What I find in the research, as I'll show you later, just to explain a little bit, is there, in these cases, this is not the biggest thing happening, especially not the kind of competing legal norms. This is what you expect, but this is not the core thing that's sustaining, that's sustaining misconduct. If we go to a, a next level, we have enabling rule breaking. So first of all, we have opportunity to violate, and there's two literatures behind this. One is the criminological literature, uh, and by the way, normalization of deviancy is the sociological literature by the Anne Vaughan, which also is very much cited in regulation studies. The enabling of rule breaking, the opportunity uh, to violate means, okay, people are more likely to break rules if, if it's possible to do so. Vice versa, you can stop rule breaking if you make it harder. It's a good example, speed bumps. If you have good speed bumps, you cannot really speed. I mean, a really good speed bump is a wall, right? You cannot speed at all. A good bicycle bump. Or even if we look at how, how, we f how we prevent suicide bombers on planes, we don't try and deter them. We try and understand how they do it. So for instance, the liquid bomb plot, we did an analysis. 
afterwards when these guys were caught and we found, okay, let's not have people take too much liquid on planes. So it's a very different way of thinking. What can happen in organizations is there can be um, structures, values, and especially practice that create opportunities to violate rules. Uh, Yuval Veltman's work on behavioral ethics and other behavioral ethics work has also shown that if there's more situations to violate, people feel less ethically uh, bothered by violating rules. If there's a large opportunity, your ethics change. So that's an added point here. Another enabling of rule breaking is an idea that comes also from criminology and behavioral ethics. It's a paper from 1957, Sykes and Matza. Uh, that show that people are able to break rules because criminals, I mean, criminologists have asked, how, how can people commit crime? I mean, don't they have a moral thing? And they say, well, they're able to neutralize it beforehand by certain justifications. And there's several techniques. One is you deny responsibility. One is you deny victimhood. You deny damage. Or there's the technique of the ledger. I've done so many good things, I can do something bad. In behavioral ethics, this is called moral licensing. Um, and I won't talk too much about that. So these are enabling forms of rule breaking. There may be more, but these are the ones I'm, I, I found and focused on. Then we have things that obstruct compliance. So there may be an organizational lack of support to follow the law. This can either be technical, it can be educational, but it can also just be a support for those norms. More important is strain. Strain is also a, a, a chronological theory, again, an oldie, that's also been applied to white collar crime. And strain basically exists if um, the goals you have in your life don't match the means that you have. And the response that people may have to that is rule violation. And we'll talk a lot about that also when we look at these cases. Finally, there's practices that run against values. This comes from social psychology. Social psychologists have shown that our behavior is a kind of balancing act between a kind of normative system, let's say our better angels, that comes either from our own consciousness but also from the broader normative uh, system that we're part of, the legal system, a social normative system that says you should be doing good things, and a kind of hedonist system that says you should ju just be doing what you want to do regardless of it. And what they've shown is that if you see a violation of rules in a context where the rule is very visible, you're more likely to violate the rules than if you see violation of rules in a context where that violation is not visible. So the experiments they did were with prohibition signs. So you put a prohibition sign, uh, let's say a speeding sign, in, a, in an environment where everybody's speeding, but people will speed even more compared to an environment where there's no sign. So it, it, the paper is called the, the reversal effect of prohibition signs. The bigger idea here is if there's a disconnect between the values that are propagated and the practices that you see around you, the values themselves are going to be undermined. Um, so that de de it delegitimizes the power of positive social legal norms. So positive social norms are the social norms that are in line with the law. So sorry for the long theoretical start, but I think this is one of the major contributions of the paper is to offer a framework of analysis that of course is not perfect, we're developing it, and there's probably a lot we can add. So with these three cases, I'm pretty sure you all know the Volkswagen case. Does anybody know in which year Volkswagen started to cheat on its, on its emissions? Anybody? Well, you told us. Uh, yeah, I told you. Anybody <laughs> else? I was surprised. Yeah. Anybody else? Just guess. Any guess? About 10 to 15 years before it, uh, it was reviewed? That sounds reasonable. No, in 1973. 73. 1973. Of course, they weren't doing, doing it with software, right. yeah, but they, they were using other techniques. They were fined. I mean, they may have been doing it even earlier. This is the first time they got caught and punished. The EPA fined them for 200,000 US dollars in 1973. So there is a perfect case. It's been going on not for a decade, not for two, no, for as long as I live, which is 45 years. I mean, well, the, I hope they stopped, but we, we still get indications that there is, for instance, with CO2, with CO2 emissions, they again have been the car industry more widely. So Volkswagen cheated on emissions. Um, they did so in a way that was conscious. They made a conscious decision with a small group. Um, they didn't just do it in the case they were caught in. They did so much earlier. They also did it in the 90s. They. Um, 
they continued to cheat on emissions even after they knew that the regulators were going to find out. And I'll talk more about that. So that's a clear case. BP case is maybe less clear. I'm not just talking about Deepwater Horizon. So BP, in its uh, operations in the US, it had three <coughs> major types of problems. One was in Alaska, where it had a lot of leaking pipes. It had very dangerous operations, uh, was a lot of accidents, and it kept on going. Then it's in its Texas refineries, they had multiple explosions, the worst one in 2005, killing, I think, 10 people. And then, of course, we have 2010, where we have Deepwater Horizon. So here again, we have a long term, starting in the, in the 90s, uh, of things happening. Wells Fargo is maybe least known outside of the US. I don't know if you know about it. It's a California-based bank where bank employees uh, were found to, on a wide scale, have uh, either sold clients products they didn't need uh, without their permission, open bank accounts, open insurance, or even fraudulently open things for non-existing clients. And this wasn't just one branch, it was multiple branches, it was widespread, going on also for at least a decade. So here you have three cases that are quite well documented. What I do in these three cases is I look at five aspects in, this, in each case. Don't see this as more than it is. It's just a structure for me to tell a story. What I do after each aspect is go back to the original framework to see, okay, am I finding these things and are they helpful for me in analyzing this? So let's start. In all three cases, we see we have underdog positions. If you look at BP, uh, late 80s, early 90s, because of OPEC, I mean, BP used to do oil exploration largely in the Middle East. They largely did onshore oil, oil, oil exploration. After OPEC, they were kind of kicked out of the Middle East. Uh, it was much harder to get profits, and they wanted to have a lot of profits. They were, um, at the time, just moving toward privatization, so moving from becoming from a state company. And the new CEO set a very strong, ambitious target. BP was going to be the largest in the world. How were, the, how were they going to do that? They were going to do that through offshore exploration in high-risk areas where nobody was going to do it. So that's BP. Then if we move to Wells Fargo, Wells Fargo was a regional bank in California, uh, wasn't ranked very highly. Uh, they got a new CEO. The new CEO said, okay, we're going to be number one. Number one in the world. Um, and the new CEO had a, had a, had a, a way to do it. Let's sell more more products per customer. And the campaign they had was called Going for Great, GR8. Eight products per customer. You know what the average in industry is at the time? It was less than two. So they wanted to go four times as many as, as, as competitors were doing that. You already see where this is going. Uh, Volkswagen also struggled, which is kind of hard to understand from a European perspective because Volkswagen is at least in Holland seen as a very successful car company, very reliable cars. Uh, also, many people have a Volkswagen. But in the global market, Volkswagen wasn't doing that well, especially on the US market. So, the US market, they were known for the Beetle, unreliable car with an air cooled engine. Cool, but not, not good. And actually, the strategy to uh, work with Porsche was to make, to show that an air cooled engine, the Porsche 911, could actually be a good sports car. And sure, they had the transporter, but after that, they weren't seen as something you wanted to buy as an American. I mean, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but they just, yeah. So they saw a huge opportunity if they only captured that market. So what they needed in that market was larger engines, which Americans want. Um, but at the same time, there was increasing pressure to also have environmentally friendly engines. And what they saw was that there were two options. One is go electric or hybrid, as Toyota has done and several our, com our, car our companies. The other one was going for clean diesel. If you go for clean diesel, you have several options. And I, I have to be careful not to get carried away when I talk about engines. Um, but, the, but, but two options you have. One is you use a, a substance, a blue substance, um, uranium. It's sort of uranium, but it's not. It, it's uranium. But you need an extra tank. And they thought, because we're not a known brand, and also they wanted to keep the weight of the car down, so Mercedes, they put in a big uranium tank, so you never, had to, you never had to fill it up. But they said, well, if we put a big tank in, 
And if we, if we, if it, it's, we're not going to have any space in the boot. I mean, it's literally these kind of discussions at that level that we're talking about. And the small cars, so Americans aren't going to like it. So they had a small uranium tank, which actually meant that it couldn't, either, either people would have to tank twice for gas and uranium. Who's going to buy a car like that? Where you have to do the extra. Trip? So that was a no go, even though it wasn't that expensive to install. Or, all right, they could find other ways, which we'll talk about later. There's another other thing they could have do, done is have a catalyzer, a catalyst in it, but that would uh, force owners to change the filter, which again had, 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 had problems in the market. So what we see with all these three companies have ambitious targets, yet they have risk prone means to achieve the targets. Let's go back to BP. What BP did at the same time uh, as they had these new targets for oil exploration, in order to get profits up, they cut costs. So BP became a cut cost, a, a cost cutting company. What they did, they laid off a lot of their engineers. So you're going to do high risk oil exploration without engineers. That's asking for trouble. Um, Wells Fargo, what we saw is uh, they were asking people to do things and open all these extra accounts, even though it wasn't really possible. So again, it's a high, a high, a high risk target. Third, we see at uh, Volkswagen, they were trying to do what was impossible, get these bigger engines that were clean in ways that technology wasn't really possible in small cars. That wasn't just the thing. There was strong pressure to meet these targets. So if you look at, um, at Wells Fargo, for instance, which is one of the more interesting cases, we see that employees were held to these targets in monthly meetings. In monthly meetings, they would go to the branch, and all these employees would ship to show how many of these targets they had, had, had succeeded in. In January, they had a run to the gauntlet month. In January, they, they were supposed to have extra jumps. So employees would have to run through other employees who were dressed up as knights and beating on their swords, and then had to write down whether they met the targets. So it was immense pressure to meet this. And, and the pressure wasn't just things that you can see in incentives or see in the structures. They're very much in a more subtle way. What we also saw is that this wasn't just at the employee level. Volkswagen is a good example where uh, the CEO, uh, Pierre, uh, at the time was very much known of being a dictator. So he would get people in his office. And um, if last week you had a profit, but this week you didn't have a profit, he would shout at you. He would scold you. So the director of Audi, I mean, these are not just lower level people. These are main brand directors. They would be completely scolded. He would also fire these people at will. He wouldn't even tell them. They would read in the newspaper they'd been fired. So these are high stress environments. So what you get is you have to do work that you're not really able to do. And you can't really, I mean, there's not a lot of wiggle room. So that creates strain, that obstructive rule following. So we see this, it started in the incentives, it started in the structures, and then it moved into deeper values and practices. Okay? So this is the start of it. So it's a very different thing. It's not as if these companies said, go and break the law. It set people up so they're maybe not having another option to cut corners. And so that's the start. S second is, um, okay, how, how did they respond to these goals and strategies. One of the questions I ask in the paper, why didn't people speak out? I mean, normal human beings to say, look, selling aid products, that's impossible. Somebody higher up in the organization should have at least said, this is crazy, we can't do that. Somebody in BP should have said, you can't do this with firing all the engineers. Volkswagen, somebody should have said, this doesn't add up. Yet we see, if we look at the documents, that first of all, a lot of people didn't speak out. And, and, and of course, you've all read about similar cases where there's a, culture of, uh, there's a culture of silence. What's interesting is what are the kind of mechanisms through which such a culture exists? Part of what we see is even when people speak out, nobody responds. So you're, for instance, there's employees in BP in, in, uh, in, in, in Alaska who have tried to contact even higher up and please have tried to contact the main office in London and say, look, it's going completely wrong. We, we, we just cut $100,000 on a, on a certain pipe. Because of that, it's completely leaking and it's going to cost us much more. Their reports were just put in a drawer. Everybody smiles politely, put in a drawer. Put in a drawer again. So at some point, the social norm that sets is you speak out, nothing happens. Even worse, some people who speak out get fired. 
Even worse, people who have spoken out and something goes wrong and actually it gets up, these people themselves get blamed because they spoke out but didn't really do something. And Gary Gray has done a lot of work on this where he calls, he talks about, he talks about, about responsabilization. If you give people the right to speak out, but not the kind of power in a broader sense to actually be able to speak out, you're setting them up for failure. And if something goes wrong, these, these weaker people in organizations will be the full people. So we see some of the other elements that I, 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 I mentioned here. Um, it's not so much the hierarchy. They were very different in hierarchy, but it's how information flows. It's also the job security. Even if you have formal job security, there can even be high stress in those environments. Um, and yes, there has been in intimidation and also repression of speech. So all of this results in some of the cultural elements that I talk about here. Social norm not to speak up. That's, that's the norm. You don't do it. Cultural silence. But it also creates an opportunity for rule breaking. If nobody's speaking up, I can, I can break rules. Nobody says something about that I park my car in a way I shouldn't park it. Uh, I can park it there. Um, it creates also more stress and uh, undermines also support to comply. And we see this at, at different levels. It's not in the structures, but very much in the values and the practices. Then we look at, okay, what happened when people started to break rules? And that's the interesting thing. I mean, Volkswagen since 1973. So first of all, we see there's rule breaking over a longer period of time, and there's many cases where there's no response. Somebody breaks rules, there's no response, there's impunity. When there is sometimes a, a, a response, and this is all before scandals go out. So it's kind of the internal, okay? At some point, there's rule breaking. First of all, it's not found out because people don't speak out. Second, when it's found out, the organization doesn't really respond. It's like, oh, I mean, it's Alaska, who cares, part of business. If there are responses, the responses are, okay, it's one bad apple, and there's actually blame shifting. It's not, there's no research into how does this link back into the organization? What, we, what can we learn about what sustained it? So this creates a, a descriptive negative social norm. So it, it normalizes deviancy. Other people are doing it, and it's acceptable. So not just that they're doing it, but also that it's, that it's acceptable. And of course, that creates further opportunity. Again, we see it starts with practices, but here it moves into values, both uh, explicit and, in, and implicit values. We then look at what happens after the scandal goes out, out into the world. And, and this is where I think it gets more interesting. I think a lot of what I've said so far is not counterintuitive. I think a lot of what I've said so far you can read in the news. What happens after exposure is several things. First, there's a downplay of damage. So, so first of all, you blame individuals. So for instance, Wells Fargo, what they did is, okay, it's the individual rogue employees. You know, they fired 30,000 people. And they even, in, in, in one branch in Colorado, they fired so many people, there was nobody left. <laughs> so they had to rehire the same people because they still wouldn't have a branch in Colorado. Um, which is interesting because uh, if you want to change your culture, firing people if the, if, the, if the behavior is so widespread is a very hard thing to do. Second, you downplay the damage. All right, let's look at BP. BP, right after Deepwater Horizon was discovered, the leak, at first they kept on saying, no, no, the experts on TV are wrong. It's just a couple of barrels. It's not thousands or tens of thousands of barrels. When the evidence came in that it was a humongous amount, I forgot how many thousands of barrels per day or per hour, they started to say, well, still, the ocean is very big. The ocean is very big and all the oil will dilute. You won't notice it. Then they said, look, animals in the ocean have many ways of adapting themselves, even if they get into contact with this. It's not that bad. So what happened, they had all kinds of neutralization of what happened, all kinds of neutralization uh, 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 techniques. These were justifications afterwards, but they set a value for everybody in the organization that could neutralize any further wrongdoing in the future. Volkswagen was the most extreme in this. So what Volkswagen did was, first of all, their response to uh, exposure was, first of all, make sure that um, they can't get evidence. So f uh, I mean, the story of Volkswagen is interesting. There was a North Carolina lab that did tests on Volkswagen. Uh, it, it, and I don't know why Volkswagen, it was not because they were, they were suspecting cheating, it was for another reason. They found that when they drove the car on the road, the emissions was completely different than when they ran the test in the lab. 
So they presented that at a conference in San Diego, and at that conference, somebody was from Volkswagen was in the audience, and they knew, from memos we know later, they knew they were going to get caught. The California regulators then picked up on this, and for a long time, for over a year, Volkswagen played this game with the California regulators. They kept on saying, oh, it's a testing, and, and the people from, from, from North Carolina, they were postdocs, what do these people know? And this is complex, and there's a lot of, I mean, you don't know our cars, and they kept on playing that game. At some point, they had to admit something was wrong. Then they said to the regulators, okay, we'll do a recall of the cars, and we'll, uh, because it's, it's, it's our systems, it's the software, we'll calibrate again. You know what they actually did? They made the software even more effective. So they made it harder to detect what the software was doing. They not only lied to regulators, they told all their car salesmen that they were recalling the cars because of an electronic defect. So they lied to everybody. So what you see here is that, that going after the liability for the company created behavior in all three companies that actually was deflecting blame, that was undermining the, the ability to know what behavior actually was going on, but also, neutralize, also neutralizing their guilt and shame. Neutralizing guilt and shame, again, Volkswagen, the case that keeps on giving. Volkswagen, what they did after everything was known, they tried to make the argument that it wasn't so bad. You know how they did that? They set up a test, and you may have heard of this, it came out in the news in January 2018, earlier this year. They set up a test where they put monkeys in a, in a lab, and they put um, um, two kinds of car gases on the monkeys. One was from a Ford 250 from 1994, so this is a big pickup truck, a, 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 a petrol based, not a diesel based. The other was a clean diesel um, uh, Beetle, I think from 2015. Now the results, what they shown, because they hoped they could show that the Beetle wasn't as bad, the Beetle wasn't worse. <laughs> so the Beetle actually was worse. They even did this with humans. So here you have the company that, that built Hitler's car that was then putting gas on humans. That, of course, that completely backfired, but you can see the kind of thinking there. How can we shift away the blame? Of course, that's really bad for the culture. If you want the organization in the future not to keep on doing these things, they have to recognize that it was wrong. They have to set the norm. So what we see here is a neutralization uh, that, 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 that occurred because of fear of legal liability and loss of reputation. Finally, and this is my final point I wanted to make, we see in all organizations that there have been mixed messages. So what happens after the scandal? And this is an interesting thing. So after we have this pressure to go after individuals and CEOs that are as high as, as possible, which are responsible for some of the problems here, what we also get is new leadership. And that's an interesting thing. Always watch new, new leadership. What is new leadership supposed to do? The whole literature says tone at the top is everything. I argue that a positive tone at the top without a change at the bottom is worse than not having a new time at the top. And I argue that based on these studies about these signs. What happens? You have to imagine you're an employee in BP in Alaska or in Texas. 2005, there's a big explosion. Uh, BP steps down. There's a, new, there's a new CEO coming in, and he says, everything's different now. We're now all about safety, and we're going to change all these things. What do you see, what do you see surrounding you? There's still budget cuts. There's still risky oil, oil expression. There's still no way you can do it in the right way, but you hear the people at the top saying that everything is going to be legal and compliant and safe now. Your conclusion is going to be, they're not serious about it, they're lying. That means that the ability that leadership has to create any influence on behavior at the top is diminished even further. So that's a hard thing. We see that the pressure on new people coming in is to actually have a new message. But the structural reasons why at the bottom of these organizations they're not able to do things in a good and non-risk and, and legal way may not have been taken away, so they may not even have the power. If you look at the, at the economic models that they're running on, it's, it's quite hard to do the things that they're, they would actually have to change their goals. So that's my whole story. I've put this slide in the paper, which is not a model, it's just a way to show you, and it's also not chronological, the kinds of things that are at play that create this kind of negative uh, conversion of, of powers that create a negative, uh, a, uh, a negative corporate culture. So you have strain with, the, with, these, with these high risk targets. 
We see that there's no possibility for dissent. This creates opportunity to violate. There's more violation that normalizes deviance. Uh, people operate with impunity, which, which doesn't set a norm, which then uh, uh, there's also, also, also blame and deflection of guilt, uh, which also there's neutralization. Uh, and finally, there's a cognitive dissonance between what is said and, and, and what is practiced. If you have all these elements, you have a problem. Okay? This is sort of where the paper s stops. Um, I write more about how to change it. And I want to say maybe five more words on, on, on where I'm now. I've already spoken 45 minutes, and it's quite long. Sorry for speaking so long. First of all, where am I going with this? So these are some of my conclusions. First of all, on a normative level. Based on these three cases, if what happens here is more widespread, uh, and that's an empirical question, um, there are certain things that maybe we, we need to reconsider. The first thing we have to really think about is, how do we respond as a legal system, regulatory system, society, maybe also as management, to these major forms of misconduct? And our gut response to go after the highest level individual in the organization, in of itself may be creating more of these norms and more of these negative norms. So we have to be very careful when we're doing that. What I argue in the paper is that we can maybe draw lessons from transitional justice studies. If we look at what we do after mass misconduct or mass atrocities, for instance, in Rwanda, in uh, South Africa, there's a combination of punish the worst of the worst individuals first, and then create a safe setting in which we have transparency and we have ways in addressing the kind of norms that we're there trying to, and trying to change them, which is very hard to do. Of course, in those situations, it's much more sensitive because you're talking about actual human beings having been killed or, or having been, been, been violently treated. Here, we're, we're not so much talking about it, so I'm arguing for thinking about ways in which after the worst offenders have been addressed, we can have a truth and reconciliation type process that addresses some of these things. For instance, in my own law school, we've had this case, the, the person resigned, but still, we had structures that for 20 years, uh, we didn't listen to uh, complaints coming up. Our former dean didn't listen to that. He's now in the, in the Dutch Supreme Court. We had several leaderships who weren't listening. Uh, we had another case where, where there was plagiarism and there was co-authorship issues, again with a, with a senior professor over 10 years. So we seem to have sort of cultural elements that are very similar to what I see here that we haven't addressed. What I've seen since and I've talked with my dean about is, look, if you're just going to go after the punishment and then because of privacy reasons we're going to protect everything else, people are going to feel unsafe. People who have suffered from this, they're not going to see that you have taken them serious. We're not going to address the reasons why people haven't spoken out. We're not going to address the systemic uh, things that are at play. We're not going to address the stress that gave people the power to take these positions. We're not, going to, we're not going to address the hierarchies. So it means a different approach that moves beyond punishment and beyond liability. So I'm not saying we should do away with punishment, but we need to have that combination. In another forum where I presented this, I got questions about, OK, what does this mean for other corporations? So the argument I make for the worst corporations is that they should do forensic ethnography. If I, will, if I was hired as a chief compliance officer at Volkswagen, you may have heard that they hired a new compliance officer and she was fired in a year because she couldn't get the job done. I would probably say let's hire a whole bunch of qualitative scholars to go deeply into these processes as well as do the kind of analysis that I just presented. That's often not possible for any average corporation to do on a, on a daily basis. So if you have the worst of the worst cases, there's probably enough resources to do this. So it means hiring, in those cases, different people. We now normally hire ex-prosecutors. Ex-prosecutors are the worst to do this because they're going to do a whodunit for humans and everybody's going to clamp up and, and they're not going to be able to actually get to this level. It means you fire a whole bunch of people, it doesn't mean you get rid of them. For companies that don't have these issues, and I'm now on the scientific board on culture and behavior for EY, the uh, so former, former Ernst & Young in the Netherlands, and I'm developing this toolkit, if I use this, this consultancy word, of how do you do a heat map, a risk analysis uh, on, on existing corporations. And I'm doing it based on some of the things that I've seen here. There is objective elements here. We can actually study through both looking at documents, for instance, strain. We can look at whether the goals that the company sets actually fit their, their needs. 
Also, we can do it subjectively through surveys. We can ask people about, for instance, whether they... Uh, thank you so much for your long attention, and um, I look forward to talk, with, to talk about this with you. Thank you very much, uh, Okay. Um, so let's take... Uh, Fascinating topic. I definitely want to read your paper. It's really interesting. So, the real world is probably continuing, but you can imagine two simplified interpretations. One is there's a set of companies uh, that are really bad actors, and, and this identifies them. And the other one is that every company's rotten, yep. and some happen to be unlucky and they yep. get caught, or there's an explosion. Yep. And you know, how can you test those different hypotheses? Yep. There's an anecdotal thing on the BP. I was at a workshop, a meeting a couple of weeks after the BP, and a bunch was sitting with a senior vice president from Shell and Exxon, and yes. he was furious at BP. Yes. And apparently there have been efforts to kick them out of the American Petroleum yes. Institute because they were routinely violating yep. all these industry standards, yep. supporting that yep. they were rotten actors yes. compared to these other ones. Yes. But, yes. But, how could you test uh, yep. when you can't get into yep. these other ones yep. really to see? So that's a great question. That, that's the basic problem of, of studying compliance. Mm -hmm. We don't know what's, it's the iceberg. We don't know what's under the water. So my father was former vice general counsel of Shell. Mm -hmm. And when I told him about BP, so, so BP, by the way, is an interesting story. The, the kind of, the way BP presented itself to the world, they had this, so first of all, they were the first major oil company to admit that there is a global climate change in the late 1990s. The first one, way before anybody else. I don't even know if the others have, have already done that. Second, they, they changed their complete marketing strategy. They became BP instead of British Petrol, and the kind of slogan became Beyond Petrol. They got the logo of the green sun that you can see here. I mean, this is not the logo, this is the kind of activist form of it. And my father said in the late 1990s, early 2000s, when BP did that, he said, we were all laughing at them. They were the worst ones according to them. So I completely agree with you. In some of the literature that I read about BP, they were talking about Exxon. And some of the scholars that I read were saying, Exxon is the best company after Valdez to, in terms of safety culture. So I mentioned that at one other talk that I did. Some of my colleagues came to me, white collar criminologists said, look, he has a new book on Exxon. They're horrible. So my basic, um, my basic reaction is, there's two ways on, on dealing with this. First of all, once companies get caught in scandals, at least those companies are really bad and we want to address them. What I see is the way we now address them is not right and we want to change that. So this paper, it's really focused on those. It, second thing we can say is that um, for other companies, at least we can develop risk assessments. That's what I'm now doing where we're not sure how bad they are, but at least the company can see in that way whether there's some of these elements are there. Of course, they can completely do it in ways that it won't show up, which would also be a cultural thing. Um, so I think that that's the element there. In general, studying compliance, this is the problem. I'm doing a book with Melissa Rory from Nevada called Measuring Compliance. And we're looking at the trade-offs of different methods of studying compliance. And every method is, is flawed. So the kind of case studies that I do or the participant observation can lead you to a very valid understanding of what actually happens, but it's not representative. Um, if you use governmental statistics, you have an endogenous problem. Uh, you, it's, it's as good as the quality of the inspections. If you're using self-reports, not only are people under-reporting, we know from tech studies that people are boasting. So for instance, Valerie Braithwaite's work on a tax compliance in, in uh, in Australia, she's done surveys with over 10,000 people about individual tax payment and, and reporting. She finds that I think 9% um, of people don't fully report their income. So I've always asked myself, okay, what does that mean? What does the 91% mean that, that does fully report? I don't know what it means. I don't know what the bias is. There's likely a group that won't admit it. What's even worse is in the 9% based on research from the late 80s from tax um, from tax compliance in the Netherlands, we know that within the 9%, there's people who will boast that they're evading taxes. So that's the problem. With any method you have, you have these, and, and that's something we have to, re to, to, uh, to recognize. So that's also why this paper, at least, is, 
um, very much based on the worst companies that get caught. I spend maybe 50 years of my career studying companies in China. Uh, I'm completely not naive. I'm the opposite. I don't even know what the, I'm, I'm maybe cynical. I mean, I've been to companies that were listed as in compliance by the regulators. They actually sent me there. I mean, Chinese authorities saying, oh no, study that company. It's one of the best. They would never do that. I, I spend a year there. I slowly recognize, because I know the villagers next to them, I slowly recognize that the company is one of the worst because they're evading 24-hour monitoring equipment that the government is using by having these other, other discharge pipes. That's the problem we have, data, data, data. So, and that's why this, this paper, I kept the focus at least more on these publicly known worst apples. The other part of it, sorry that I answer so long, is the difference between the bad apple, the barrel and the orchid. And the orchid is the market. So one comment I got in, in two conferences that I presented in is, what you're talking about is capitalism. Basically, the basic problem here when you look at the strain and when you look at kind of why they make targets that are unmeetable, it's all capitalism. So actually all the companies will have these problems and it's the broader structure. So if you want to change these cultures, good luck. You're not just talking about the company you're talking about. And my counter argument to them was, but I can't prove that, there's still variation within that structure. I can't prove which company is more, but I'm pretty sure there's worse companies and better companies. But you're right that we don't know which ones. Yeah. I would like to ask about uh, these five aspects that you just uh, showed, how, if you can tell something about how they, the way you chose them. You mean these five? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Aspect, yes. Your yes. No, they're not. As I said, they're not. These are these are the things that I'm. As I said, there's a very non. I'm not looking at. So I'm not doing a variable analysis. So if you look at, I, I don't know what kind of methods you learn, but um, generally you see that a lot of social science research, also in political science, is about causation, where you're looking at independent variables, independent variables. Great. There's nothing against that. There's other research that is based on case studies where what you're looking at is not as much the, dependent the independent variables influence on dependent variables, but rather the more complex interplay of multiple variables on each other. And you might not even call them variables. So there's a different thinking behind it. So there's also a very different method where in, um, for instance, in survey-based research, you have all these respondents, sorry, 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 respondents, and they all ask the same questions and you compare over a large group. What you do when you do a case study is you get informants and you triangulate to build the story of what happened. So you're much, much, uh, much more asking, how did it happen? Why? And through the how, you get to the why question. Um, so of course, there's, there's causal elements in it, but it's, it's a different way. So to explain to you these five aspects, I chose them to tell my story. They're a storytelling tool. They're an ordering tool for me to get all the data that I had based on on analyzing these cases and that for all these elements in the culture that I think play a role, I use this to in the paper to kind of show for each element what happened and they're kind of chronological, not fully because these goals and structures change, but they start with, okay, what are the, what are the companies actually trying to achieve? Then it moves to, okay, why do these employees not respond to that when it's unrealistic? Then, okay, as soon as you get violations and wrongdoing, how, so it's a, it's a way to tell stories, which I know is not how you normally train to write papers, but I find it's a good way to at least do a presentation, also make papers more readable. Um, so it's, it's not a, um, a, a, a strict analytical tool, it's just a structuring tool for myself. And you got, you got an idea of how to choose them because you got familiar with empirical cases? Yes, the, yes. So it's inductive. So it's inductive, it's grounded, it's, it's reading deeper and deeper on these cases. That's also how... Uh, it's, an, it, it's an iterative process. I, I, I studied the cases, I knew the literature beforehand, and I saw that, that, that these elements were clearly there. Not, not, not that I just picked these because of that, but these were the things that I based on reading the literature. So it's a very different type of project than maybe than you're used to. And there's a lot of journals that would never accept it, also because it's 40 pages. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. uh -huh. uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, I actually
actually have two questions. Yes. So first of all, in terms of research aspirations, um, so while the business management approach to organizational culture often speaks about cultural change and, yes. and believing in achieving cultural yes. change, the anthropological yes. take on organizational culture treat it as something more uh, stable, not yes. static, but yes. yet stable, yes. and uh, he's doing more of a dis dis descriptive, descriptive yes. uh, task or yeah. job. And uh, it sounds to me that you you come from an anthropological perspective with anthropological mm. assumptions and yes. convictions. Uh, but mm -hmm. again, it sounds also that yeah. you also believe in achieving yes. cultural change. So yes. How do you jump from anthropological assumptions to yeah. to, to more practical implications for achieving change in a given culture? Shall I ask? Shall I answer that question first? Yes, of course. Because you because you have two, and and I think so. You're 100 percent right. So the paper ends with change, and. Um, so I'm, I'm a little bit of what my colleague Jerry Cohen, who also studies Chinese law, I, he always says about himself, he's a hopeless optimist. And I think I'm similar. I'm, I'm first of all very pragmatic. I do research to solve problems. Most anthropologists don't do that. I'm not an anthropologist. I, I, I couldn't care less for theory unless theory is useful to analyze problems in society. That's just who I am. Um, so I do this analysis, first of all, because I think the descriptive part of it and even the analytical part of it is very important for practitioners to grapple with this idea of culture. They have no way of grappling. I mean, I mean, for instance, Wells Fargo developed this. I mean, I mean, consultants sold this tool to Wells Fargo to measure their culture by uh, doing a survey whether people were happy or grumpy. And if it dips below eight, so the happy, happy, grumpy uh, ratio, they have a cultural problem. And I think that's, it's, it's one variable that's important. It, it indicates strain, I think. But it, it just doesn't really get us to a kind of more, more holistic uh, analysis. So, so the, the core thing here is to help people think about what are the kinds of things we can look at in these worst cases that become a public. Second step, which is I'm now working on, okay, for other cases, how can we do a risk assessment if these companies really want to do that? Of course, that's a big if. Uh, again, I can use the same type of information. Of course, it should be iterative. Everything I found here may just be something that's a first step. We probably find other variables. We can add them later. We can also see that others are not as important. That's something where we just have to add case studies. It's not something we can easily do through traditional quantitative means because each case is, is so complex. So we just need to have a bigger broad body of case studies. And also probably more people with other literatures as information. About change, when I look in the management science of organizational change, first of all, most of that science is not about toxic organizations. Most of it is about normal organizations, if that even exists as a difference. But it's about making them more efficient. But I think there's a lot of things there that we can look at. So first of all is um, changing personnel. So Shine in his book already says, sure, you got to fire, fire a couple of people, hire some new people. Questions here is, how do you know who to fire? How do you know that the people you're hiring don't have the same values and practices and mindset? Maybe it's the industry. Maybe it is capitalism. Then we have a major problem. But for instance, with banks, I think it's pretty sure that there's several certain things. Same with oil companies. At, at certain levels, uh, with Volkswagen, it seems nearly Every, I mean, still after, the cri after that crisis, I read a news report that 97% of diesel cars on the roads are not in, in compliance with the emission norms. All the car companies were doing it. So that's the first step. It's, it's, it's to think about your personnel. You can't change all the personnel. You can't. So what you then need to do is to get into the mindset of the existing personnel. One is uh, tone at the top. So I already said that if you're going to do tone at the top, uh, it has to be combined with a real change in, in, for instance, how you set your targets and the means for that. So for BP, I would say uh, lower your goals, uh, invest more, reduce your profit. Problem, of course, is who's going to listen to me? The only way you can get them to listen, and this is the kind of conversations I've been having with my dean, for instance, is if you show them that this is a matter for survival. 
if you can show that the whole company goes bankrupt. The problem with the three cases I just mentioned is Volkswagen became the biggest car manufacturer, biggest car seller after the crisis. BP also became the number one oil, oil company, and I, if I'm not correct, after Deepwater Horizon. I think Wells Fargo also, it, in the midst of, of all the crisis, became the number one bank in the world. So it, it may be harder to convince them, but at least we have some things. For instance, if you look at, at, a, at, a, at a public case, the US at, at, Athletics uh, Union has now filed for bankruptcy because of the, mis, the sexual uh, misconduct or the sexual assault cases. I mean, and I, and I saw when I was talking with my dean, I actually sent them that news, sent them news about CBS, and I said, look, this is what can happen. Uh, our students have been harassed by a professor who haven't responded. Uh, parents can tell their students don't go to Amsterdam University. So that's something we have to think about. Um, is CBS an, an alternate case? Because nothing seems to be happening with CBS. It's early. Individuals. It's early. Well, yeah. most cases, nothing happens yeah. but firing individuals. I mean, to be honest. So, so I do care about the change. At the same time, and you're right, that's probably sort of the, I mean, I'm, I'm an amateur, I'm an amateur anthropology, amateur anthropologist of me, or maybe the scholar of, of, of institutions, I mean, knows how hard it is. If things are set at these deeper levels, and especially if it's also embedded within a market, within uh, having to meet shareholder targets, which I didn't really talk much about, it's not going to be easy. So. Within that, sure, I'm, 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 I'm willing to look at all the things we can look at. The question is, can you sell it? Especially when the company is not at a survival stage. So the other thing is, how do you get rid of values that are in the brains and that are more deep? Shine talks about unfreezing. So unfreezing starts with a shock to the company, which means that the tone at the top is now, not now we're going to do everything, dif everything different. Tone at the top is, we're going to die. We're all going to die unless. And that's the thing that's interesting to look at, but I haven't seen enough evidence scientifically how that works in these types of organizations. It's probably also very difficult to study. So that's the kind of balance I'm in. Um, I try to stay away from it and focus more on the kind of analytical framework because I know we can add value there immediately. Um, I, would be, I would find it hard if you ask me now what can we do immediately and still keep these companies running in a way that they're profitable? So, and I'm not an expert on, on, on profits, obviously. Your second question. Um, or did you have a follow up on that? Uh, no, no. Okay. Just um, continue to the second question. So, my second question uh, relates to methodological choice. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, you suggested that observation, really sitting in an organization and studying the culture of no. a given organization is the best method. But I know that other researchers um, argue that it's not such a good method because when you become part of the organization, you can start identifying yes. and uh, adapt to the organization's yep. logic yep. and values yep. and norms. Yep. So yep. would you also uh, yep. Consider interviews as a ideal method, or do so, you have kind? Of, do you create kind of hierarchy within great. the methodology? That's a that's a great a, a great question. As I said, with interviews, you can get to the things people know and want to speak about. So you can get to the cognitive deliberative level, and you can get to things they actually want to talk about. What we're talking about here is both things that are at the unconscious level that are not fully aware. Sure, we can trigger them with surveys or interviews, but it's harder. Second, we are talking about behavioral practice in every day, that we can ask them what they see, but they may not be able to see it or willing to talk about it. So I think surveys are definitely part of the toolkit. So I, I believe in mixed methods with these cases, ideally. But part of the mix, ideally, for the worst cases, should also be observation. I'll give an example. And you're fully right what happened. So one of my former PhD students, maybe David has met him, he's called Cheng Xiang. And Cheng Xiang did his PhD and he didn't finish because he went into high finance. He only had to finish one chapter. And he's now told me he's going to go back to it. Um, so Cheng Xiang did his PhD on two people. 
I have some weird projects. So one PhD on two restaurants, he did it on two people. So he, he did a participant observation for of a year in an environmental protection bureau. So he, as a law student, he came in, they needed him for some work. And the environmental protection bureau with the inspection unit, it was two guys. And he was a year with them, going on inspections. When he came back to Holland after a year, he had gone native. He was completely like people there. It was very interesting for me. It was as if I, as if I was running, kind of aspiring, and I was deprogramming my agent. And that's actually what then, then is part of the technique. So anthropologists, their, their technique is twofold. First of all, it's all about note taking. And the notes that you take in the beginning are the most valuable. So when I look back at my experience in the US over five years, the first year is where I had my, where I had my biggest ethnographic observations. This is my first week in Israel. This is also where I'm very aware that everything I see is special. I can now see things as a complete outsider, as a novice that later probably I won't notice anymore. So a good trained anthropologist knows very well to do good note taking and to do very detailed note taking, which is, I think, uh, compared to other methods, you're the measurement tool yourself. So you have to hone those skills, which is one of the hardest things to do. Not everybody's good at that. So I know Bridget Hutter, for instance, she told me her training kind of came from her father. Her father was a, 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 a policeman and he would ask her when they went out shopping to observe which people might be stealing, and to kind of observe who are suspect people. Some of the same techniques anti-terrorist police are using are the techniques of anthropologists. It's these small observations and learning to memorize, learning to make notes. The second is being very aware of what happens with your own values. First of all, that they don't filter so much, but also how they're changing. So anthropologists, good anthropology, are very much astute to this. It's not easy. So it's very easy that it goes wrong. So I would say if you, and that's why I'm saying that I hope anthropologists come bec become more involved in this, which is a two-side thing. One is, do people want to hire them? It's a high investment of money compared to doing a survey. So it's probably only going to be the worst cases where I hope that in a settlement, uh, the US, US Department of, 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 adjustment, sorry, of Justice says, you got to hire at least 20 anthropologists. Second is, are anthropologists going to be interested in this? And are, uh, are they able to speak to people in practice? And I've seen too often, and it's changing, for instance, Amsterdam University has a degree in applied anthropology, but too often they've just been speaking to themselves and not to things of change. And, and that's going back to your first point. So I think we need both. We need, sure, we need the interviews. Um, and to say one other thing about interviews, I've developed this, this interview technique um, to get to the deeper levels of consciousness and to also get through um, uh, these, uh, these sensitive questions. So first project we did, which I did with Anna-Laura Wainwright, who's an anthropologist at Oxford, and several colleagues in China, including Yun Mei, who is one of my PhD students who worked in the restaurants. We did a project about citizens living in a village next to a factory, and for years they've, they've suffered from pollution, over three decades. Uh, they lost their livestock, uh, cows, that, I mean, that they used to plow the fields no longer. They all died. Uh, they got weird diseases. They had economic costs. And the company would give them a little bit of money, but that wouldn't cover their cost. And over 30 years, they didn't, they didn't take much action. They would blockade things every now and then at the factory, but they never went higher up. Only in 1985 did they have one complaint to the township level, which in your eyes would still be a village. Even when the, when the factory exploded and 10 people died and the media came and everybody else came, they wouldn't talk to outsiders. So it was a puzzle for us. So part of what we wanted to understand was their environmental health awareness. Problem with that is, as soon as you ask somebody, what do you think of the pollution, you're shaping their awareness. As soon as you ask about, uh, is the pollution uh, affecting your health? So what we did, we asked them, what kind of water do you drink? Do you drink it from a bottle? And the citizens would say, yes, we drink bottled water. And we knew they were going to say that because we knew that. Then we said, oh, since when? Well, since 2003 or four or five. Oh, and then we'd ask why. 
and then explain pollution. We'd have these open questions. They would talk more about it. They would, we would nod, make these sounds like, I mean, all these kind of techniques. And they would talk about, we'd let them talk as much as they could about what they saw the pollution was and what the effects were. And then we had our activism question because we're studying activism. We'd, uh, we'd say in Chinese, it's a ban. What can you do about it? And again, open question, we let them talk. I did a similar thing with tax evasion of lawyers in China. So here I am interviewing 100 lawyers about their own tax evasion. So I would ask uh, where they're from because I needed that uh, as a variable. I would ask uh, where they studied, how they were hired, which all helps me to understand the kind of hiring procedures in the firm, their values, some of the organizational elements. Once you're... Um, once you have set a price, and that was sort of my compliance question, even though I didn't fully study compliance, I studied more how they feel behave with others in the terms. And they then explained to me, some would explain, all right, then we get a stamp from the firm, we get the money through the firm, and it was completely according to legal standards. Some would say, no, we, we get the money and we just take it in our pocket, which is illegal. And some, I would then ask if they said it completely legal, I would kind of look at oh, always. Kind of surprise, and they'd say, no, not always, and they'd explain. Or I would ask them, do others do that always? Which was my social norm question. And from the social norm, I would sometimes pivot back when they say, oh, everybody does it. Oh, everybody? And they would then talk about themselves. And then I would leave it for a bit because it gets sensitive. I would ask, is it risky? Which was my, my deterrence question. I have a paper about that. And then at the end of the interview, after talking about non-sensitive issues like, uh, do you ever do things outside of work with your colleagues and getting to the culture, the firm from, from I mean, operationalizing a different thing, had a small survey about the ethics of their boss. Everybody loves filling that out. 12 questions, talk about your boss. At the end, I'd get back to tax. And I'd ask them about, there was a tax reform where they had to go from a 12.5% tax rate to 40%. They were all angry about it. The 40% tax rate did give them reductions, but still they probably have to pay more. And they were so angry that... When you have, even if you take enforcement away, you have a socialization of people in the organization where they care about safety as an intrinsic value, where maybe they care about compliance as an intrinsic value. So that's maybe the ideal where you want to go. Maybe I'm too cynical to believe you can actually go there in most, in most cases. So that's why I've not focused on that. I mean, that's going back to your point. But there's a focus on that. I mean, I mean, there's a lot of talk about that. Also because companies want to show to regulate, so there's a very practical element, we have a compliance culture. And it's part of our compliance management system is to foster a compliance culture. On the other end of the continuum, as I said, is you have the criminogenic, uh, the criminogenic corporation. And this even goes back to Sutherland's speech in 1940, but also Clinton and Yeager uh, talk about this. And that's more of a criminological concept, and that's organizations where breaking rules has become endemic and maybe even part and parcel of how they make money. Um, of course, the worst part, if you go there, is organized crime, where the organization is criminal. Okay, that's even worse than that. It's not criminogenic, it's, an, it's organized crime. Where you're not, I mean, of course, they have cultures too. I mean, culture of silence is, is a core element there. But one before that, it's still a business that seems normal, seems legitimate, but the way it runs, I mean, Bernie Madoff is a good example, is based on, let's say, for instance, fraud. Or it's, okay. So, so, so I think those are on the extreme sides. If I put toxic corporate culture, I would put it, if these are the most extreme, I would probably put it somewhere here, far away from compliance culture, closer there, if we, if, if we want to put it on one line. Then the question is, where are we going to put disruptive culture, a disruptive organization? That's an interesting one. So a disruptive organization uh, has a business model that at its core, um, I mean, depending on the one, but I think Uber, Airbnb are very interesting. They have uh, opportunities for profits only in markets that are so far regulated in a way that creates inefficiency. And by breaking the, re the, the regulation there, they can tap into the inefficiency in a way that, that others couldn't. Um, so the question there is, what is their end goal? Is their end goal to have a regulatory change? Which I think is their end goal. So their end goal is in, at some point that in that new market because they were the first to go in. They're going to be the dominant player. But at some point when it gets deregulated, 
Um, the, of course, when they go in, there, others can go in as well. So there's still going to be competition. But at least what they do in the future at some point should be legal. So I think that's an important, I, I mean, that's one type of disruptive company. That kind of disruptive company could have, uh, other than its core model on that regulatory rule, other than that, actually not have a toxic culture on many other elements. So if we're talking toxic culture, of course, you can ask which type of rule is it toxic with? So you could say BP, maybe it's very toxic on, on elements, but maybe on others like sexual harassment, never heard of it in BP, maybe it doesn't exist. Maybe it's a very good employer. I mean, Volkswagen, very good employer. I mean, I mean because of their state government, I mean, uh, I think it's North, Northwest Rheinfallen, or I, I may be wrong, They're very strong labor which is an interesting thing. They have very strong labor rights, actually very good contracts. Um, so you're, you don't have to be toxic on all elements. So a disruptive company might be trying to disrupt one set of regulation, but actually be fine with others. I've not heard that Lyft, for instance, uh, the other big uh, car, car sharing company, Lyft, I've not heard uh, the kind of harassment stories or the kind of CEO type bad tone at the top as I have had with Uber. So I think it's an interesting question to think more where we're going to place these concepts that I've used. There's probably others one can use in there. Um, I think we can put it also in different contexts. So we can uh, talk about are these, first of all, public and private organizations. I think there's a big difference there where we, where we, are, where we are applying it. I see many of these elements also existing in public organizations. So, the, so then the question becomes, okay, if you have shareholders and you have that context surrounding it, where are you going to place that? Is, that? is that fundamentally different from not having that? So, so you can say the same for small versus big businesses. Small businesses without shareholders, privately owned, family owned. So I think there's these kind of context variables that are more are in, in the way that they're, they're organized, the way that they're broader. I mean, if you move outside the barrel into the kind of wider forest of trees, uh, the, the, is it orchid or orchard? It's an orchard. Orchard, yes, I've been saying orchid. Orchard. So in the, in the wider, Flower. yes. And, I mean, if, if you want to stay in the orchard, I mean, in that metaphor, but I don't know if you have other ideas of, um, of theoretical concepts. Because this is where I've started to kind of place what I mean by toxic culture within these other concepts that are better known. And I think toxic culture in of itself is in the literature still a new concept. And I think my, my paper has, is one of the first that talks about it and tries to define it in a certain way. The whole movement to like B corporations and that whole movement of sort of do good corporations. So yes. Along that spectrum too, further to the compliance. Well, they're all in the compliance culture yeah. and, 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 the, and the safety culture. And, and I know there's a lot of reports on that. Susan Silby has, has been involved on, in, in that. The chemical industry has been doing things. And that's not what I'm talking about here. And I'm not saying that if you solve this, you have that. I'm saying if you solve this, you don't have this. <laughs> but, but, but you, you really, there is no uh, strategy for solving it. Well, I mean, out of your paper. And because we, have, we don't have time, I would just yeah. uh, say, yeah. so if I'm thinking about compliance and complying, compliance in the context of regulation, the most innovative uh, element or kind of innovation, regulatory innovation, is compliance officers. Hmm. Now, uh, <laughs> is it true? And <laughs> couldn't we uh, speak about those uh, issues? Sure. sure. Uh, so, so first of all, what are we asking compliance officers to do? What is their core task? Second, how are they trained? So most compliance officers I've talked with, they will formally say we should decrease violations in the company, but their everyday work is managing liability. So managing liability makes a lot of these things worse. I mean, if you're covering your ass, you're blame shifting, you're neutralizing, um, it's also in, col in collaboration with Okay. The second thing is how they've been trained. So they've been trained in, I mean, I mean, depending on what it is, but, but especially the lawyers who are in charge in some of the cases, they've been trained in law, not in behavior, not in organizational behavior. It's the same with the independent monitors, which is another innovation. Uh, they're former prosecutors. So 
I think once you really look at this, um, first of all, you have to have companies that are brave enough and daring enough to say, we're going to work on our culture. Sorry, yes, yes, we have to go. Yeah, I'm done. Okay. So, so we have to work on our culture, which of course is risky. It might mean that you get a bad reputation because you go through a phase where you let your dirty laundry out. Um, it might hurt your stock. It might make things worse. That's what, I, what, what I've been talking about in my own school in, in terms of how far can you go in, in the kind of truth and reconciliation that you need to do. So I think right now we're not even close to this. And I think some of the discussions about a safety culture and corporate culture, sorry, compliance culture, that's where the compliance managers are. And I don't think that's solving these issues. It's not even looking at these issues. So. Thank you very much, Ben. Okay, thank you.